Um, okay, comrades, uh, good evening. Um, my name's Kevin Bean, and I'm, I'm a member of the organizing group of the Labour Left Alliance. And I've been involved in drawing up the, the, the various parts of the educational program. And I've uh, just appearing on here this evening of uh, two things. One, to remind you that we've got a full um, program of speakers that starts this evening, uh, with any luck. And uh, we'll continue then really up until about uh, December the 17th. And we've got a series of talks and uh, sessions uh, on key turning points in socialist history. And that, that this is a sort of historical series, um, but it's, it's uh, not just a series of talks, it's also discussions on those key turning points from the, the peasant revolt in England and the peasant war in Germany, uh, the um, uh, English Revolution, uh, the American Revolution, uh, the, um, the growth of socialistic ideas in the French Revolution, and then working class organization, particularly the world's first working class party, the Chartists, and then really the development of socialist ideas and socialist politics throughout the 19th century, uh, culminating in the growth of uh, the idea of an, an international workers' organization, the first international and then the second international. Um, so this, uh, th this series uh, is, as I say, it's designed to sort of interview some key uh, ideas, but also to have some good discussions. And um, apart from reminding people of the sessions, I'd also like to um, invite anybody that would like to um, either help to organize um, these sessions, uh, maybe be a speaker or contribute in other ways. If they would get in contact with the Labour Left Alliance, then we'd be you know, very happy to, um, to hear from you. The, um, the other thing that the uh, uh, sort of team has been working on is actually next year's uh, sessions. Um, we've actually got a program that now goes up until next summer. Uh, we're expecting that th these forms of politics are going to continue for some time. And, um, uh, you, know, we, we, you know, we really thought this is a great opportunity to bring comrades together all over the Labour left and over the left wing spectrum in general. And um, next, um, the, the next year's program is a, loosely based around the idea of revolution and counter-revolution in the 20th century, looking at the great revolutions, the Russian Revolution, obviously, but other revolutionary movements in Germany, in China, but also the reaction of the capitalist class in the form of imperialist wars and, of course, uh, of fascism and Nazism. So again, if comrades want to get involved in uh, either speaking in those sessions or suggesting speakers or whatever, please contact the Labour Left Alliance. Um, there's a, if you go onto our site, there'll be an email uh, for the secretary and for the, the education comrades. And then the last uh, set of plans, uh, before I hand over to Lewis, who's going to chair the session, um, we're, we're also looking to develop really a lot of other discussions around uh, reading groups and broadening it out beyond politics and history onto <coughs> other aspects of culture and indeed economics and society in general. So looking at, uh, at economic and social issues. And again, if comrades want to suggest topics or indeed offer uh, any sort of program, then uh, you know, we're more than willing to do that. So, um, so that's, the, that's the plug for the rest of the sessions and also for the sessions next year. And um, you know, I hope, hope comrades will come along to them, but also will offer uh, ideas for speakers or offer themselves as speakers. So uh, uh, thanks very much and sorry for interrupting the start of this. I'm now gonna go back into the audience and, um, or rather I'm gonna go onto the terraces and start cheering or booing as the case may be. So thanks comrades, I hand over to Lewis now. Thanks very much. Kevin um, for introducing the next uh, series of webinars coming up. Um, so yeah, I'm Lewis Nesbitt, I'm with LLANI and uh, I'll be hosting tonight's webinar about um, uh, Marxism and the Premier League and I'm lucky enough to have uh, Peter Kennedy here to introduce us to the topic. Um, 
in terms of the background, um, you know, besides the, the current context of, of what's happening right now with, you know, football teams like Wigan, for example, having to go on administration not, um, not that long ago, uh, Bury uh, Football Club going into administration and actually being terminated. Um, there's there's a, a precedent of, of what what financialization of football means. And as you can see from what I'm wearing, advertisers and um, the various areas of football which have been negatively affected um, by capitalism, you know, turning it from a, a sport for the working class as it was always perceived um, into something a bit more consumer based. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to ramble on much more. I'm going to let um, I'm going to let Peter introduce himself and kind of give us a bit of an intro. Anyway, how's it going, Peter? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Um, can you hear what I'm saying there? Yeah, yeah, hard yeah. and clear. Right, so we got my video up and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, your video's working yeah. fine. Yep. Yeah. Um, I've written a book on on football, which so maybe you should just start with with um, with that. It's um, it's a Marx. It's called, um, and I'm paraphrasing the title, a Marxist political economy of football in neoliberal times, and it's aimed at um, looking at the um, elite European football club uh, leagues, but mainly at the, the EPL, the English Premier League, and um, <clears throat> just to note how um, the changes in that are. Um, are kind of unique um, you know, representations of the way capital, uh, modern capitalism is right now, um, but also at odds with, with, with what we take to be capitalist enterprises. And so um, <clears throat> the book covers a number of things um, from the way um, footballers are, um, are now thought of as prized commodities. Um, and have a kind of unique position, both in um, helping to uh, extra, not helping to extract surplus value, but to helping to um, redistribute pre um, already existing surplus value from um, corporations that get involved in football in terms of marketing, branding, and advertisements and media rights. Um, so football, <clears throat> the massive wages of football is. It's, you know, that we see in the Premiership, um, which reach millions of, of uh, pounds per year, is um, a mixture of um, wages and the good old fashioned sense of, of, of working class, but also um, redistributed surplus value, which, um, which is kind of um, a unique thing. Um, in capitalist relations, then working class um, have surplus value extracted from them and that, that gets directed to the capitalist class who, who realise that in profits that they've shared out um, the surplus in terms of profit and rent and so forth. <clears throat> so um, a chapter of the book looks at the, um, the labour process of footballers and um, takes on board the market relations and production relations, i.e. the labour process. I'll come back to that in a moment. The other thing, the, um, another chapter is on the development of stadiums, you know, the commodification of space um, within which football takes place and, um, and the use of that space to, um, to try to um, extract as, as much money as possible from the consumers, i.e. fans of football, and, um, <clears throat> and also to use that space to, in the modern stadiums, like the, the new stadium for um, Tottenham, the one proposed by Everton um, near the Albert Dock there, and um, and the remodification of Liverpool and, and Manchester City and, and so forth, and Arsenal obviously is one of those stadiums, brand new ones that um, is emblematic of um, modern day football, and the stadiums themselves are could they're kitted out with uh, surveillance technologies, so um, each fan. Um, that mainly the season ticket holders is allocated the seat and that seat is um, <clears throat> more or less um, <clears throat> a nodal point for um, 
you know, for knowing where that particular fan is and that particular fan buys um, stuff within the stadium through the credit system, through their own credit cards. Those credit card details are taken and, and the patterns of consumption are noted within the football ground and outside. And so lots of information are passed on to others as well as the football club in general. <clears throat> to um, And they have that information on, on the kind of consumer goods and the kind of things that a fan will buy at, at the match. So the match day itself, um, takes on a new dimension. It's the old, the old one of like fans going in and being the twelfth man to make part of that commodity spectacle, football. But also as consumers, as um, uh, consumers of different uh, merchandise on 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 tap, on on tap. And um, the stadiums are open for and are far more open these days. So they're not just um, in the past before the EPL come along. And a stadium would open a couple of hours before the match, and you get your pork pie and a, and a pint. Um, if you're a man, <clears throat> an adult, if you're like me, a child at the time going to heaven, I'd be sitting on the bars, the crash bars, so I get a good view. But you're allowed in then, and um, and then you watch the match, bugger off, and, and the gates are closed unless they're going to be opened again for the reserve match the next week. You know, you play one at home every two weeks and play away, as we know. But now there's a kind of more porous relationship between the community and the stadium. They're open from, you know, very early on during the match day. And uh, they're open at different times during the week for their museums and um, the shop merchandise and so forth. <clears throat> so the, and the stadiums are kitted out. As, as they built these kind of purpose-built stadiums, they're not the same kind of stadiums that you you know, we usually get with the kind of bear pits for, um, you know, the traditional stadium was a kind of bear pit where the fans were close and the grounds were square. And they followed the contours of, of the game. Now they're kind of more rounded and, um, you know, to maximise the space, there's no um, discrete sort of openings at the ends. Every area of the stadium is, is kind of enclosed and used for seats and, and so forth. But it's also um, kitted out with the left at least electronics too. So the space is commodified and so we're just as much as consumers as, as fans. And there's that uneasy alliance now within fandom between um, notions of fans as, you know, um, are we fanatics? Are we um, uh, consumers? Are we uh, customers and so forth? And we are, we are all those things. And some people just go and they kind of, you know, the new fan are, are those that can, sort of um, play the tourist role across different stadiums. Cheers. <clears throat> That's my, my sort of um, butler coming in there. So anyway, um, <clears throat> so, um, so it's a new space. So, the, so there's a chapter on that. And then the other, another chapter is on um, the, the other dimension of fans and that um, fans when they get involved in the game, do do so from a kind of commercial side, so that um, they have their commercial head well and truly on, and, and it's and it's kind of very reflective. So that um, the emblematic of this is the um, the emergence of the supporters direct and the different um, the supporter trusts within various um, various clubs and their supporters. Trust themselves, um, which, are, which are under the guidance and, and the rules of the Supporters Direct, which is a quasi-government organisation, um, which, which emerged during the Blairite years as um, football has become commercialised. They, they, they are there to kind of like, um, to try and restore order um, to football's um, football's political economy in terms of the use of the football ground, in terms of what you pay for tickets, in terms of the fan experience and allowing fans some say in the running of, of, of their team, of their club. And that's in, in response to um, to the way certain owners have used clubs these days as a kind of like, um, um, you know, an asset for, um, uh, you know, to make money through the building of new stadiums, through the, um, you know, the use of the, of the, of the club as a, 
um, an asset to um, create more debt. Um, like the Glaziers up there take over Man United, and immediately they went from surplus to a, a debtor club. And so everything is about debt, you know. And, and they, um, <clears throat> so it's kind of like, um, you know, to counter that, the, the supporters direct the merge. But unlike the, the traditional um, fan organizations, supporters direct are there to kind of run it, you know, to direct. Um, clubs towards like a new business model so they're very commercially orientated and they're very conscious of um, football as a commodity and so um, they give advice on how stadiums should be run and lower down the leagues uh, you know beyond the EPL where the clubs are often in crisis or just just about balancing the books and they play their part in kind of um, ensuring the you know, the reproduction of a club over, over a given year by um, either investing in the club and taking part, share ownership, and um, or even um, acting as workers, ground staff to keep keep clubs, stadiums up, up to shape and so forth. So, <clears throat> you know, the typical fan organisation, like uh, supporters trust, um, are very much like market orientated, and they and their preoccupation is to try and run the clubs on a more responsible exchange value foundation and so in my eyes they, they their kind of outlook has, has been commodified they they're um you know they go for things like cooperative um point <clears throat> kind of business enterprises and um <clears throat> and they are <clears throat> sorry they are a relic of that commercial that kind of colonization of the commercial ethic within football so fans, uh, if you go and away from the Sports Direct and Sports Trust, if you look at fan websites, <clears throat> then fans are not just moral owners of clubs and talk about the players as kind of um, prized assets and um, amazing athletes that they are, <clears throat> but they also feel they have a lot to say on what our club spends and what, what our money should be spent on. And they have this kind of um, a view of... Um, of how to balance club finances and a lot of forum exchanges are, are based on whether they should buy and sell the commodity labor and um, the commodity uh, the footballer and um, they have this kind of like exchange value attitude a kind of brute attitude sometimes players once they pass their physical prow prowess then their exchange value is questioned and they must leave the club and so there's a kind of commodified outlook on on forums too which um which I suppose goes along with the digital age and, and, the, and the greater access to communicative webs and the time spent. And that's another factor too, that <clears throat> this commercialization of, of um, clubs comes at a time when, uh, and over a period when um, of uh, deindustrialization in the heartlands of some of the big urban uh, cities of, um, of the UK. And, um, and so new identities are formed around um, the ethic of support and fans. So there's a kind of work ethic involved in that, which displaces old identities and in, in the um, when when workers were in um, industries that have, that declined in the docks and the um, you know the manufacturing industries, the coal industries and stuff. Um, so there's a kind of new identities formed now by, by fans, both as consumers, but also as kind of owners in a way, you know, not just moral owners, but almost, um, and the, you know, the, you can see this clearly, they see management and the, the, the board, the CEOs as basically custodians. Um, they have financial control, but, um, the real ownership belongs with fans. But that's seen more and more in commercial terms. So there's been a colonization of mindsets amongst fans. And um, much research, if you look at research on football, as I have, and in academia, then it's shifted away from uh, hooliganism when you look at fans, which is a big thing in the 70s and 80s. It still goes on now, but the shift in emphasis has gone towards what fans are doing commercially, you know, whether the consumers, whether the nature of fanhood is changing in ways that I've described. And so that mirrors the kind of um, real developments within within the fan base. So, um, you know, this book I, I, I've written, um, 
how long I should I should have with my brother David, uh, Dr. David Kennedy. And if he doesn't get a mention, he'll probably um, tough me up when I see him when I go back to Liverpool. Yeah. So um, the book also goes on to um, to look at um, you know the way finances run. So the the kind of wider political economy with it within football. And it's quite hard to talk about without using kind of symbols and diagrams and graphs. But um, basically, um, I tried to map out in one of the chapters the the kind of um, the accumulation strategy that's a, uh, peculiar to, to the football club, um, as you know, within the EPL, the, the elite clubs, and that seems to be one based on where. The surplus, if it does exist, exists at a tiny level within the production process itself of football, i.e. the match day experience. And, um, but the real match day experience and the, and the digital version, which is on Sky. So there's two parallel productions going on. The virtual production of the game and the, and the physical production, which goes on on the field of play during the match day because the fans are part producers of themselves. So they kind of uh, producer consumers or pro shop, whatever you want to call it. You know. So, um, <clears throat> so we look at this accumulation and the, the the large flows of money that come into football. They're enormous, as we know. And um, I think the the last big round of um, media rights, which goes back a couple of years, um, was a, a package worth around about five billion. And um, so each year, that's kind of uh, fed into football. And alongside that enormous amount of money is an enormous amount of money from corporations who want to advertise their wares, their products, commodities through the, through the EPL and because of the media rights and the greater exposure um, that, that, that represents for them. And so all this money goes through the system, goes uh, into the coffers of clubs, and then they um, part with most of it in terms of um, handing it over or uh, distributing it to elite players. So the lion's share goes to elite players. Um, you know, the production process itself within clubs is based on try is, is based on tickets sales and, and season tickets. But the 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 money is um, that's earned on a yearly basis through season tickets is dwarfed by the amount of money that flows through in terms of already created surplus value from these large corporations. And so, um, and the whole lot co goes through the system and back out again, and so much so that they, um, they end up spending more than they do get in revenues. So although we're looking at the development of a giant industry called the football industry at an elite level, and we're looking at the way this has been commodified and it's often called a capitalist industry, then it's, a, it's still a funny old business because it's a business that on the whole, at the, the level of the league itself, it doesn't make a profit, it doesn't make surplus value. It kind of drains surplus value from, other, from the corporate sector, um, filters it through the system where people, various, you know, actors or agents and so forth and players and um, club directors um, absorb this surplus to the extent that they absorb the surplus and even more so clubs are um, at the league level there's often um, a desk overhang year on year so um, it's not a capitalist industry like any other in that sense it's kind of merchant you know it's kind of merchant capitalist that uses um, Money through, you know, money inputted, money outputted through the other side, and and very little um, profits are made. Um, so it's a purely business, and um, I'd like to go into more than more on that, but I might be able to do that in the in the discussion itself. Um, I'd just like to say something about the the players. Um, I've done an article for um, some management journal. I can't remember which it was, but. Um, it was on the management of the labour process for, for elite players. And um, it was looking at how, because the market situation of elite players with the Bosman rule in, in um, I think it was 85, 86, or I can't remember exactly now, which allowed play, free players off from, um, 
from their basically feudal relationship with the club. The, the, the player was tied with the club for, for a certain amount of years and couldn't um, sell, it, sell the labour power freely. Then the Bosman rule give freedom, um, give more freedom to players to have their own um, personal agents who, who um, organise contracts for them and they uh, gave them the upper hand and they were able to more freely sell their labour power. Now, that's because of their market situation and the peculiar skills they have at the top end of the market, then they can extract rent for the, for the, the scarcity of those skills. And also because they're brands as well, um, they're able to get extract even more of that surplus to, to, you know, in terms of their income. So a player's income is based on um, the scarcity of the uniqueness of their labour power, but also the power they have in the market um, in the competition to buy the, you know, the, the best players, the, 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 um, the, you know, the, the best of global players across, um, across Europe and um, South, uh, South America and Africa. And, um, but it's also because they're, they're a brand, you know, they're an important brand and, and there's, there's certain rights, branding rights, certain um, rights to use, use their um, personalities, their bodies as, as kind of like advertisement boards and so forth. So the whole package gives them a vast amount of market power, which you could go into. But the other side of it is that, um, and the pound of flesh, it, as it were, of that is that the the club um, wants has ascended to kind of control more of the um, the, the productive side of, of the footballers' um, day to day activities, and so the market situation and the 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 work situation is is different. The work situation is heavily controlled and colonised by scientific management. If you look at football clubs, then. Um, <coughs> Yeah, and science has, has developed a lot more on, you know, in terms of diet, in terms of exercise, in terms of monitoring players, um, players wearing their GPS um, their gadgets and devices to show, show them how much they've run on the pitch or they've done in training sessions, whether um, their heart is beating too rapidly in a training session, maybe they're becoming ill and to take some time off. So every aspect of their life is is now kind of um, scrutinised and surveyed. And um, even to the extent that through social media, they give them training and how to manage themselves and on site to be the correct commodity for the club. And a lot depends on that because if they don't and they lose the pecking order in the squad, then the, then the wages suffer. While they're keeping the squad, keep the, you know, the heads down, do the right thing, be the, the brand for the, for the club you know, the kind of um, emblem of what the club represents in kind of um, brand fashion, then they can um, accrue those wages that they get, that, 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 that they're able to extract. So, um, and if you, if you look at, you know, if you look at each of these parts in turn, the fascinating, so what players, the diet, at, 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 you know, the dietary foundation of, of each player is scrutinised, taken over by the club, they, they more or less um, supply um, meals for players and if they don't supply meals out in, indoors, they tell them what they can eat outside when they go to bed at night and, um, and, and, and more besides. If they're caught smoking, it becomes a big issue through the media. There's one Arsenal player, I can't remember his name now, but um, I think another, another chap was Wayne Rooney caught smoking once and that was seen as a kind of a real, real sort of like tarnishment of the brand and, um, and also a threat to this football player's kind of like um, health um, and so uh, ability to kind of um, play at the elite level. So um, there's a fast, the fascinating thing is to look at the way science has developed, sports science within clubs. And so if you look at the old days, you'd see on the, um, on the bench on Saturday afternoons when you, they only played mostly on Saturday, and on the bench would be um, the manager smoking a cigarette or whatever he's doing. And then be the coach. Um, so if they had a coach, you know, the, which is um, probably a trainee manager. And then you'd have a, a couple of people with uh, buckets and sponges ready to run on the pitch. Um, if you look now, then there's a host of science, you know, sports scientists 
and the coach themselves, you know, Jürgen Klopp and all those kind of people, they have their own philosophies on how to play the game. And they talk with the, you know, the sports scientists about how to evolve a team effort and to work as a team and devise strategies as a team. So the game becomes almost like, um, I, you know, a game of chess and a lot of it is mental. And, um, and that's relayed back to, to players. Every match is decoded and deconstructed for every move that players make. And, um, and the sports scientists and coaches um, use that information to, um, to personalise training regimes and, and, and so forth. So from diet to the, um, to the mobilising of science, to the use of digital technologies to, um, to send messages about players' activities, physical activities on the pitch, how far they turn, how fast they turn how many tackles they do and all the rest of it. Then the labour process side of things is heavily controlled. So on the one hand, we have the market situation, which players control, but that, but that is countered by the, the fact that they have to sell their soul, their body, their mind, their mentality, their emotional labour, not just physical labour, to the club while they're there. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that because... Um, Oh, that's just off the top of my head, and I'll probably, it's probably better to get some feedback if it is. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, uh, that's a great overall kind of introduction to your book as well, your, your, the knowledge you've gained from, from your studies. Um, I guess to start, I would kind of like to know, you know, where do you think the start of this commodification came from? Because, you know, there's, there's the, I guess what the fans would say is whenever you started seeing advertisers on, you know, football tops, um, for example, just before the start of this, um, you know, we were talking about this t-shirt here, you know, this was a period of very, of a lot of controversy whenever, Crime Paints and um, I think Hitachi was next, you know, that was big controversy at the time. Uh, but what about, for example, you know, whenever players were being sold for ridiculous sums, you know, the one I always know about was Kevin Keegan, you know, going for half a million in 1977 to Hamburg, I believe. Um, that's always considered when it was the first big money move out of England. You know, it, where do you think the commodification really starts? Is it whenever players are being sold for big money or is it advertising coming into the game itself? Um, do you want me to answer that right now or take more Yeah, questions? yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it probably, yeah, there's a number of um, pointers, um, not just one kind of origin. Um First off, there was, there was the, um, you know, the crisis of football presented by the, um, the various stadium tragedies and the Hillsborough and the Heisel Stadium being the two main ones. Um, the Heisel Stadium tragedy, which has um, led to um, scores of people dying on terraces in, in Europe in, um, I think it was the Belgium Heisel Stadium. Um, that led to English club being barred from Europe for, um, I think it was five years. And um, in 18, 1989, there was the Hillsborough disaster. And, um, and I think at that time, football hit a new low. And there was a lot of government attention on trying to um, revise football um, to look at how it can be <clears throat> kind of um, placed on a new, a new pathway. And so there was a look at stadiums and, and all-seater stadiums and um, make a stadium safer and, um, and putting up sort of um, safety barriers around grounds. And there's a period of time where we see all that netting around the, the, um, the, the pitch itself where, they, where they're separating um, fans out from, from the players. And um, 
So there's a big move towards redefining stadium spaces, which led to um, you know the commercialization of that space, uh, all seater, making the grounds all seater, and that obviously meant that um, less fans in a given space could be fitted in with all the new seats. But and so there was a um, there was a kind of pressure on to kind of like increase the um, price of uh, attendance at at, um, at the game. And, um, and this kind of um, encouraged what was already happening, which is a kind of um, embourgeois zealot of, of football, the football fan, in other words, that um, began to return. And there was a purpose to that, you know, it was by design, began to attract um, a new type of fan, a middle class fan, attract, attract the families. And so this is all part of the process of seeing the football as an entertainment and and along with that was trying to kind of cut out hooliganism. So um, the stadium disasters and the changes of stadiums gradually <clears throat> went along with kind of like um, an opportunity to cut out those spaces of, um, within which um, fans could mobilise around when they were standing up in stadiums and uh, cut out hooliganism. But it, it merely displaced it outside of the grounds where they, they often took place anyway. But so, so there's a commercial kind of in, impulse on, on, in that way. But the EPL, um, you know, the emergence of the EPL in 19, it was first muted in 1991 and came into being in 1992, also um, was part of this commercialization trend, which put um, football on a more commercial footing. And um, it, um, it led to the amplification of the search and for their revenue streams. And so um, the elite football clubs within the EPL um, had a new arrangement where, the, where um, less of the um, revenues went, you know, could trickle down to the lower leagues and they retained more and more of that revenue. And um, the EPL was a vehicle for doing that to, um, to create the distance between um, the, F, um, the other divisions, um, which are controlled by the FA, to allow the EPL to take on a more commercial footing, and so clubs themselves to take on a more commercial footing. And um, so I suppose there was these kind of trends, um, along with um, the wider context of, um, of businesses looking for outlets for, 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 for their surplus capital, looking for um, football to be polished up and branded up so that it could become a good vehicle for, that, for advertising their wares too. And the more that stadium began to look better and the more it attracted a new, more affluent um, audience at trade stadium grounds, then the more attractive it became as a vehicle for um, the, 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 the swirl of surplus capital that was, um, that was looking for an outlet. And, <clears throat> during the, the 80s and 90s. Um, we've got to remember that there's been a shift in capital by that time and the developments of free and off of uh, more mobile um, sources of capital looking for an outlet. And so um, that alongside another thing, which is the digitalization, kind of tied in with that, with that, with that, um, with these impulses. And so they came together and coalesced and um, and, and I suppose took on a more holistic um, power, you know, a, a holistic kind of um, um, entity which, um, which developed the commercialization of football. And so it's gone from strength, from strength, from, from strength to strength from there, I would say. Um, and so, you know, that, that, that's what I would say. It's not, any one thing, but it's it's a number of things, and um, so yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah, um, I guess it's 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 one of these things. Uh, football fan, you look at um, what's in front of you. Um, what you see in front of you is advertisers and you know players' wages. But whenever you explain it like that, then it's 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 whenever the football becomes divided up into different products that you can purchase and partake in and you know corporations start to have way more control for example kit sponsors 
then influence what you buy as a consumer um, later on. It's uh, I never think I thought about it that way. Um, we've got a few people asking questions now. Um, first is Kevin with a question. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, th thanks, Peter. Uh, enjoyed the, I enjoyed the talk a uh, great deal. Um, it's a bit of a comment, but, uh, but also, um, I suppose there's a bit of a question in there. Um, I, I think uh, when you're a football fan of a certain age, and I suppose I've been watching football in one form or the other from the early 60s, um, and I think uh, since I sent you a bit of a blue nose, um, I actually went into the pub where um, the, the one in Chester that Dixie Dean used to keep, the, the Dumbling packet. So I've actually seen Dixie Dean, but not on the field. Um, but I, I wanted to just sort of be aware a bit, of, or to just caution people a bit about nostalgia, because um, it's very easy if you get a load of old blokes and women as well in the pub talking about the games not like it was, and in the days when the players were, um, you know, were all very close to the fans. Um, as late as the 90s um, in Liverpool, you probably would know the pub, it was um, Kirkland's. And I was walking by Kirkland's uh, with my son. And um, in sitting in the window there were Robbie Fowler, Steve McManaman and John Barnes. And uh, I went in and I just got a beer mat and they signed the autograph for him. You know, and he was really made up. Now, that's not likely to happen, I think, anymore. So you, there's a sort of nostalgia and I wanted to just wonder whether that's all a bit false and whether it's all just like a lot of things in capitalism it's now just an intensification um and and of what was already there so I, i'm thinking of um for example um it was a liverpool team so again i'm i'm sure you'll like this example but it was a liverpool team i think it was um probably in the the late 1890s and the, the team wasn't doing very well so they, um, they went to Scotland and they essentially bought two teams. One was 10 players for the outfield and then the other, the other one was the goalkeeper. And they actually fielded a team that was pretty well just bought in. So the mythology that you have of clubs when they used to be all local lads and they were all doing this for the honour of the town and all the rest of it. And, you know, it's true. And I'm sure... I'm sure Matt Jones and other people from Glasgow will remind us that the, the people who were, you know, the, the Celtic team that won the European Cup all came within, I don't know if it's 20 or 30 miles of Parkhead, you know, and that's never likely to be repeated again. Um, so, so my point is, um, it's a rather long and rambling point, but are we just not seeing what has already been there in football, a sort of an intensification of these capitalist processes and a lot of the mythology you know is um is exactly that it's just it's now slicker and more overt and that um just as other things in capitalism have got slicker you know just as um cars have got faster you know exploitation um in factories has got more intensive then this is really what we're saying and that um you know if we're if, if, we, if we invest so much emotional commitment in it, uh, as you said, that probably tells us a lot about all the things in our lives which have sort of gone, you know, particularly a sort of sense of rootedness and, you know, familiarity in places and industries and the way that people live, live and, you know, worked in that way. Mm -hmm. And then ju just one last question to you, uh, Peter, is... Um, you know, what's the alternative? Um, before we came on, we had a bit of a chat about going to German football. And, um, you know, there are lots of different ownership models and in particular the participation, the role of fans in that. And I wonder whether you, you think there are real political demands around, around that, about controlling clubs and about making them, you know, genuine organizations. Anyway, thanks and th thanks very much. <coughs> Hmm. Okay, do you want me to answer that now? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. That'd okay. Um, I think you're right about the nostalgia thing. I think one thing about football is that um, it's always been a vehicle for entrepreneurs to get all the football clubs, professional clubs, and um, and they use them. You know, in, in years gone by, the you know they're making the same kind of use as, as the entrepreneurs now, albeit that. 
um, when I say entrepreneurs, capitalists. You know, now we have global capitalists, so before it was local capitalists. And they're doing it for partially the same reasons. They either want to like, um, you know, um, give, give, the, give the, the kind of money that they, they've been able to earn in their own industries. They want to give it a new image that they want to like kind of rebrand themselves. And you know, football is a good way of doing that because, um, you know, it's kind of like a popular thing. It's, it catches the popular imagination and it gives them um, a more positive image. So, so the, the big global um, capitalists who own clubs now you know, people, you, you can't be a millionaire today, you have to be a billionaire to own football, uh, the top football clubs. In years gone by, just the same way, you know, we look at it nostalgia, nostalgic wise, as, as Kevin was saying, but um, lo and behold, the same impulse, but it's just that it was local um, capitalists who, who were using it for the same purposes, branding themselves, um, ingratiating themselves within the community, um, seeing themselves as like custodians of of um, a product that is so important to the local fans who are also their employees, maybe, and, and during, the, during the, the weekday and, and Saturday at that time because people work six days a week. Um, in fact, John Holding, your brother's um, written a book, and I'm, I'm just um, giving you a, a chance to see it on Amazon there. It's a great book, it's on John Holding, and it's, it's exactly this thing about the nostalgia. John Holding was um, a key. Um, board member of both Everton and Liverpool. Everton, um, Liverpool, um, Everton was the original club and then that split and produced Liverpool and that's why Lewis there has got his red on today. So, um, and holding it was kind of right at the heart of those two clubs. He was a, a significant owner of Everton, sat on the board there and then he took his ball away and became the board, uh, the CEO of uh, the newly formed Liverpool, which he he, he was able to do. So we formed two clubs really. And um, our, our day, my brothers just give, um, Dr. Kennedy, I should say, I usually, but um, just give a talk on the Radio Mersey side. You might be able to cop that some um, Tuesday night on his new book and going into that. <clears throat> but there we had um, a hard head, head businessman of old. We, you know, we're going back now to um, 1892. And the two clubs split and the two were found, uh, Liverpool was founded. And um, <clears throat> the original Everton side played on Stanley Park. And so um, the Everton board turned left and formed Goodison. And John Holden kept walking rightwards um, uh, to Am Anfield side of things and formed the, the, the ground there. So um, the um, so, so, so at that time, that was uh, the split was over hard-headed business stuff, you know, like the, the price of the ground rent. Holding was the, the owner of the ground and he was extracting more and more rent from the other the others who sat on the board. But it was also political as well because the other board members at Everton, the original Everton, were um, part of the Liberal uh, Party locally and they supported Home Rule. Holding was a working man's Tory who organised the working uh, man's to um, Conservative Party within, within Liverpool. So there's a political split to that. And that was aggravated by the fact that he was a brewer and wanted to sell ale on the ground. And the, the other members of the board were all teetotalers. <laughs> so there's a number of things all compiled and brought about that split. So yeah, nostalgia in a way. But I suppose what I would say, if you, count, if you look back then and those kind of, that period that you, you're talking about, even right up till the 70s, then um, <clears throat> I think football was a vehicle where the use value aspect of it was, was still a kind of determiner rather than exchange value. Don't, don't forget that a commodity has two elements to it, use and exchange value, as Mark says, and um, what dominates the commodity form is the, the festivization of that object as a use value, as a, as a piece of exchange, a, a, a value, a unit of value, an asset. And so I think that sense of it being a unit of exchange, a value, an asset to sweat has become more predominant now, that's all. So it's not about like any golden age, it's just about... Um, <clears throat> so I suppose in, in that sense, Kevin's right, that there's been a kind of development of that commodification within the game, whereby now more firmly the value orientation of football as a, a useful social thing takes to the fore. 
but the other, but that it's never lost because the interesting thing is during the COVID, um, I wrote a small paper recently which went into um, sovereign society, some a journal that just, which is says it all, doesn't it? A whole journal given over to football, um, you know, which is run by Routledge, a big corporation to make money. So that was never ever happened in the past, it does now. But in the article, I point out how in the COVID um, pandemic, in the heart of it, when um, clubs were furloughed, you know, the, 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 the work, workers, staff, they were furloughed. And um, the kind of value on the asset on football came to a halt almost. Then the use value as aspect of it as a community asset came to the fore. And it became like a, an arm of welfare within the local community where players and fans and other members of the football club would um, would engage in charity activities, would attend food banks, supply food banks, would um, cater for things to do with key workers, you know, to make their life more bearable during the struggle. And also to, to, um, to you know, to deal with people isolated in the community who were, who were alone. So, um, you know, the... So it was clear that, you know, a lot of the clubs, and obviously this is part of the brand and exercise too, so no one's denying this kind of, you know, the, you know, the other aspect, the, the instrumental side to this. But nevertheless, it was, it became a real welfare arm, a real kind of like social el emblem within the community. And, um, and I think that's what it is to answer the, the other aspect of Kevin's question, that um, I've do football clubs do they harbour other kind of sentiments other kind of relations and then they do you know the the answer calls for the answer calls for the the needs in the community for welfare for finance and and for support with um, various charities for for uh, for people in need and while that is you know, an instrumental kind of thing as well. It all has. It also has a substantive side to it as well. And so, um, so that was interesting during that period. So, um, you know. <clears throat> okay. That's great. Um, we've got a few more people here asking questions. So, um, next, Matthew Jones. Hi, Matthew, go ahead. Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, yep. Yeah, right. No, just I think there's a couple of points just briefly because I'm going to have to go to my CLP meeting in a minute. Uh, one, I think that the, the important, one of the important points, of course, is the, the movement to the, uh, in terms of the overlation of football, obviously, is the Bosman ruling, uh, which gave a great deal more power to, to a, a select handful of players to make a lot more money. And also, of course, concentrated football in, 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 in a small... In, in Europe, which is the core of it, in, in, in effectively a, a handful of clubs. Uh, you know, you, before Bosman, you had the likes of, say, Dundee United could get very seriously deep into European competition based on the fact that they could go around Scotland recruiting young players and then sign them up in very long contracts and keep them there because they controlled their contracts, you know, for, for, for seven or ten years. And they could, they could keep these guys and nobody could, get up, get, could, could take them off them unless the club wanted to sell them. Um, and, and, and so that, that, that really just sort of changes football completely, you know, in terms of, you know, the, 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 the concentration of power among clubs and the concentration of power in a handful of footballers uh, and, and, and actually re removes, in, you know, the income from, from, from most footballers, actually. The, the bulk of people who play professional, semi-professional football are not being paid a great deal of money. Um, you know, the, the, the ones at the top are being paid, the elite are being paid a hell of a lot of money. Um, the other thing, of course, I think is that is, you know, in terms of it's a very strange form of capitalism because actually the people who are making the money or taking the money out of the out of the, the business are in fact the players. That the owners are not making in general are not making that much money at all. Uh, you know, the, it's 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 a, it, you know you can look at it as bread and circuses and a diversion and all the rest of it, but it's a very very strange model of capitalism to to to, to operate itself. I mean, it's not, it's not just football. I mean, you could go with, with, with even sort of the likes of the, some of the American um, uh, games as well. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the real money uh, that comes out of the game is in the pockets of the players and not the owners. Um, you know, and, and, and it's a sort of strange form of, I suppose, latent degenerate capital that you see that 
that existing and it's not doesn't confirm to say the normal systems of value or com the commodity or whatever else. Thanks. Cheers, mate. Yeah, I know. And I was looking at um, <clears throat> there's some data a couple of years back and um, it's making the point that not not long before the the development of the, the EPL um, and the breakaway from the FA, then I think it was nineteen eighty nine. The um, the average pay of a first division footballer was five times the average wage of a skilled worker. You know, within within in the in in, in the UK, and um, you know now it's just like you know it's uh, stratted stratted. It's in the stratosphere, anyway. Um, you know, there's a big gulf in difference, as and Matthew has alluded to, to reasons why that might be. And um, you know, the Bosman room certainly, certainly was the case. Yeah, it's just a it's a totally different um, uh, situation that football was find themselves in, as Matthew says, and I mentioned before, um, football is. Um, are able to um, extract large amounts of that revenue in terms of their own incomes each, each year. And um, I suppose like they become global entertainers, not just like sportsmen, but then the, you know, the part of the entertainment industry and there's been a blurring of the boundaries there. Um, <clears throat> you know, the amount of um, fetishism now, this is another thing that's developed in, in football that, um, you know, Fans more or less have careers in, in talking about football now as well. So there's a, you know, um, it isn't just something that preoccupies people more on a Saturday afternoon, but it's a, a preoccupation that um, that lasts the whole of the seven days of a week for certain core fans. And um, with the development of like sports programs and um, channels like Sky, with its wall-to-wall -wall coverage, then all the mundanities you can ever think of in football are talked about, you know, the, the dramas of football, footballers' lives, what's going on in the minutiae, and fans um, can tend to lap that up. The other thing to football as well, which we haven't touched on tonight, is the way it's been chopped up for betting purposes. So in the, in the old days where my dad would go along to um, um, the local bookmakers and put his bet on for the whether Evan would win the championship that year, you know, the league that year, and that was it. <clears throat> now um, you have a situation where the potential is to bet on how many corners are taken in, in the first half of a game. You know, um, how many will be taken with the left foot? Um, how many, how many uh, free kicks would 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 um, would be given in the first half an hour? Any, you know, so it's chopped up for betting purposes. Uh, there's a kind of hyper um, financialization of, 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 of that side of the game too. So um, there's a lot of things about football which are different and it isn't just about nostalgia, but the, the game seems to have like taken on a highly fetishistic form in all those the reasons that I've mentioned tonight. And while it's not exactly a capitalist enterprise, and, and I suppose in many ways that kind of mirrors developments in capitalism, and um, one of the issues and problems with Marxist interpretations of football in the past <clears throat> has been that they've taken one of two routes. They've either seen football as kind of like, as Matthew said, bread and circuses, as an ideological um, vehicle for containing <clears throat> working class outside of work. And so um, acting as a kind of um, a safety valve for um, and ex uh, expressions of emotions and, and frustrations that workers may <clears throat> feel as a result of their life in capitalism gives them an outlet for that and something to talk about that brings people together across the class spectrum kind of thing, that kind of ideological approach. So they've even spoken about football in those terms or they've seen football in a functionalist Marxist way as in terms of the forces and relations of production you know, and how players are the, the workers and um, <clears throat> the, uh, 
the um, managers or the um, the paid um, tailorite staff to to control the, the workers and how the the owners are um, outright owners and that doesn't stand up to much scrutiny and that's um, one reason why um, I got interested in a Marxist perspective was to kind of situate football within the declining forms of capitalism right now and in many ways it kind of amplifies and highlights and illuminates that the, the declining um, tendencies within capitalism so it's um, highly fetishized but not based on surplus value extraction and for me that characterizes one very important feature of capitalism right now Marjorie asks the question, um, without knowing too much about football, would you say then that the footballers are exploited or how would you interpret that? Yeah, <clears throat> I think um, footballers have um, are paid quite a lot of money, but they are exploited too. Um, they, um, they're exploited because their, their labour is controlled and... Um, and they, although they, they don't, they don't, you know, they sell the labour power, but in the selling of the labour power, um, a large proportion of the of the income that they they receive is in terms of, um, the, you know, the, the surplus value, the redistributed surplus value, as I've mentioned. And I haven't got like figures on hand tonight. I, I could have had them for you, but I haven't. Um, but Still, there's a, a level of exploitation there in terms of um, the intensity of the training sessions, the control over the diet and footballers' um, activities. There's a kind of more, and that's the irony, another irony is that the, <clears throat> the, the, you know, the control within the, the footballers' labour process, as I call it, and, and I, I include like, you know, the physicality with the emotional labour and, and, and so on that players have to give and the other things that they, as part of their task as footballers, you know, to, um, to be ambassadors for the club and the community and so forth. All this means that they, it's something that football wouldn't necessarily do unless they were controlled in some way and unless they got something from it as well. But isn't that the way exploitation takes place with workers too? Workers get a wage, they get a steady income, a career, they can buy houses, they can, if they have a career job. So they get something out of that arrangement too. That's why people put up with it. <clears throat> we don't just get duped, you know. Um, we stick with it because of commodity fetishes and we believe that we can get a fair wage within the system. Um, we gain from our own exploitation too and but we we don't gain in nearly as much as the capitals so there's still a lot of alienation going on and that's exploited football is alienated you know you've got to look at them <clears throat> you know they you know what, what they do outside with the you know most of them i'm not saying mo i'm not saying all of them some of them are kind of you know articulate and they've got real um thick creative things that they do outside of football most of them have spent their life from early age in academies being droned, being, mm. being where football and coaching and the philosophies of football and tactics have been drummed into them. And they know very little else about life beyond that. And you can see the way they live their lives that way. So um, they're deeply alienated, I would say. Kind of, uh, we don't really have any more questions per se. So I'm just going to ask if anyone has any more questions, um, get them in. And if you want to ask them live on camera or, uh, you know, just add that into your question. But if you don't, um, I can ask the question for you. Um, I guess uh, working on what Kevin said, um, you know, I've, I'm a fan of football from, you know, many different countries. I've looked into the different ways that clubs are run. Um, and the methods used in Germany, for example, of the 50 plus one rule um, kind of reflects um, I don't know if it's coincidence or not, kind of the the idea of a workers' council that, that a lot of German um, manufacturers have where, you know, workers have a kind of 
almost a bit of a cosmetic role in running the company, but still a bit of say over the over the company. And then obviously in their clubs, um, you know, you have clubs like that 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 the fifty plus one rule is sacrosanct, and they they do see the club as their own. Um, and being a Liverpool fla- fan and you know, Jurgen, seeing Jurgen Klopp um, and how he feels about football, and then seeing how that's reflected in a club like Dortmund, you know, is is it? You know, I'm trying to put a positive swing on what we've talked about because I feel like we're talking a lot about some dire consequences of what capitalism does to football. But is there a way that in England, you know, you could see a shift at all, um, or how how would a shift look like where? the you know the working class community that surrounds a football club could eventually um kind of take control of a club per se and be able to be able to compete against the you know the current market we're in where capital is is definitely king in having a club that's that's winning trophies and attracting um talent and things like that there um I think yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and I I was um, I tend to see the way things develop in um, in Germany as you brought up um, as being context bound, and um, in in the sense that in the you know, the EPL is in the context of a, a more rampant neoliberalism in in Germany. You know, not to put too fine a point on it and overrate the pudding, but there's more of a social democratic tradition of home, it reigning in capital, capital itself, and only you know um, workers um, that workers have some sort of like access to the board and a seat on the board. in in German firms, you know, there's like a two tier system in German corporations where, and that prevents um, kind of more speculative capital taking over a club and buying up the shares and doing what they want with the corporation. And that's kind of reflected itself in German uh, elite football clubs in Germany, their structure, their governance structures. So they have this, um, as you say, the 50 plus one rule where they they retain 51% of the shares and that stops anyone coming in. Um, You know, the kind of owners that you get in the EPL coming in and kind of seeing the club as their own um, resource to to make use of for you know to extract capital from in any way they can and um, and so in Germany you have this um, greater controls over wages you know controls over the um, the price of season tickets or access to the, to the the stadium to watch a game if you don't have a season ticket um, I think um, there's one study in uh, the Guardian, and uh, it's getting on for about seven years or so now, so I don't know whether it still holds up. And it was of Dortmund, and it was comparing Dortmund to Arsenal. And it was just making a basic point that a fan in England could travel to Dortmund on an aeroplane and could buy, a, buy the price of a ticket into the Dortmund match, watch the match, have a pie and a pint, and fly back again. And it would cost less than it would going to the Arsenal game. So, um, because it was only fifteen euros to to, um, to you know to get into the the Dortmund ground, but it cost an arm and a leg in you know, relative to that to get into the Arsenal game. <clears throat> so, there's a kind of unbridled um, element to the to the game in England, which. Um, fits the context of neoliberalism where the <clears throat> privatization has, has, has been more effective, the deregulation of industry, the attack on trade unions, um, to free off markets, you know, free off labor markets, free off capital markets, and all these, um, and also free the hand of, um, of, of, of owners to, um, to do what they will with their cooperation with, with the, the organizations they own, they purchase. <clears throat> and um, there's no control over share ownership. And so, um, a ta- you know, um, it's easy for, for someone in the English game to take over a particular club and control it, as I say. Whereas in Germany, it isn't it's more regulation. So I suppose um, I, I would characterize that I have more social democratic tendencies still in the German game. 
Um, <clears throat> if you look at this, um, the fair play rule, which, which came in in Europe, and <clears throat> which is being heavily attacked now on all sides, and um, <clears throat> clubs like Man City and, and other clubs like Chelsea can always bend the rules on that one, as they have done in Man City's case recently. But um, <clears throat> that, that was put in place to kind of like, to try and harness a more business, a more um, a sustainable business kind of attitude towards the clubs, which, um, and there's a danger of um, killing the goose that lays the golden egg in the, the EPL, you know, with rampant season ticket prices and, and blooming, um, <clears throat> ballooning um, salaries for players which are not sustainable over time. So um, I see it as more, to get back to your point, as more of a broad, the political economy of, of, of any nation is going to kind of like write itself and inscribe itself on the, on the major sport and um, pastimes and other, especially professional ones. Um, that's certainly the case with the EPL. And that's certainly the case with the Bundesliga in the case of Germany. <clears throat> so I don't know, to, to answer your point about the, um, <clears throat> the UK, then there's been attempts to, um, to try and change relations. And someone mentioned in the, in the chat there about um, one of those is just to resist and move your support away from the big professional clubs and, and try to, um, to encourage the development of like a kind of DIY approach to football by supporting these um, football clubs, which are kind of more part of the community and not um, totally tied to the, <clears throat> the marketplace. and um, and seeing the, that club is developing on the basis of its as a community asset. So we see that developing, and that <clears throat> kind of fits with other developments we've spoken of tonight in terms of the sports trust movement and so forth. <clears throat> so we have this kind of alternative Manchester club, um, you know, that's developed over the last 10 years, and that's, um, that's gone from strength to strength. <clears throat> but if you notice as well, it is becoming more commercial as it goes from strength to strength. And to play, move up the leagues, you have to attract the right players. That means you have to pay more money out in wages. <clears throat> that means you have to become more professional and more organised around <clears throat> um, how the club is run, you know, financial-wise, and you have to think of the club as an asset and so forth. And <clears throat> so that's... Um, in trying to get to that kind of stage where you have this viable entity, you can, you can be taken over again by by commercialization. It's hard. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> we've got um we've got Jed here as well. Um to ask a question. Go ahead. Okay. Jed. Okay, thanks for uh, having me on. I was I was one of the, the persons who've uh, uh, I agree with you, Peter. I, you know, the financialization uh, of football and its fetishization is. I'm one of those who've sadly become alienated, you know, and uh, um, you know, grew up with watching Forest and great times, um, and that will never be repeated again. Again, largely they were uh, local to Nottingham or the East Midlands, if you like. Most of the players, one or two Scots, but you know, just generally. Uh, largely local lads uh, there were three or four Nottingham players who were in the team that won the uh, European Cup that time but nevertheless even despite all that you know uh, uh, what football's become and I'm one of those players who've uh, sorry those persons who've uh, opted to watch non-league football and I've seen I, I keep a close tab on it you know and uh, and I think uh, there's certainly uh, some of these teams, they're firmly embedded in the community. And I'm thinking, uh, just as an example, in inner city Nottingham, I go and watch a team, but I try and get others to watch it. But uh, I don't know if you, you just go on YouTube, you can watch Clapton Town, their fans, for example, or, or even um, F FC United of Manchester. You know, you go, you, you, all their songs are, uh, uh, are really quite a, quite progressive or, or anti, you know, in the, the FC United of Manchester case, the anti-Glazer and uh, the, uh, uh, 
you know, the, the ownership of Manchester or a breakaway club from Manchester United, effectively. I know you've got one in Liverpool called AFC uh, Liverpool, but I think that's something that we should promote and uh, kind of quite encourage, in, in fact. And, uh, um, you know, I just wondered whether you've got any thoughts on it, Peter, because... Uh, um, sadly, I, I love football, but I'm alienated from it. But, uh, you know, uh, at least watching football at that level, uh, whatever it is, it's an honest endeavour. You know, I mean, these guys, they work uh, most of the week, they get injured. And if they're working in a building site, they uh, they can't work. You know, they truly play it because they love it, you know. And, uh, uh, and I think it's something that, you know, I, I think we should support. And it can be a, 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 a basis for uh, raising the consciousness too, you know, because uh, uh, certainly with what FC United have been doing, it's uh, it's been, a, I think, a, a very, very progressive development uh, in the football community. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I think, like, you know, <clears throat> football is a, um, comes from the community originally and... Um, it's a, it'll always have that like inherent kind of attachment to um, working class communities and um, people will strive to kind of take control back from um, from those that they, they see as taking it away from them. And I suppose that's um, part of the impulse for what you described there is like these alternative um, clubs which, um, which you describe as more honest and um, more... Um, <clears throat> more kind of like focused on football as a kind of endeavour, you know, a, a kind of a creative endeavour and, um, and as a more honest kind of connection with fans. And I, and I think that's, that's kind of like, um, in, you know, in that sense, that's part of the, what, what I would describe as the kind of the, the enduring reasons why um, people will be attracted away from capitalism and towards, um, you know, a more collective and cooperative kind of um, way of life, you know. Um, <clears throat> we do crave that. And um, <clears throat> the power of football is still there, you know, and I, I ask myself why, um, I'm still like supporting Everton and I want them to win. And, and I'm saying to myself, well, it's probably because I'm really an ace in fact. And, uh, <clears throat> and there's a kind of tribal loyalty that goes back through generations as well, which um, you hate to acknowledge, but it's there, you know. And, um, so it's a strong bond, even, even, even though, you know. So, um, but yeah, I, d I do understand the, obviously you understand the, it's a human thing to want to take control and take back football and, um, and, and other, other areas of life that we, we feel has um, been taken from us and abused and, um, and that we need to, um, you know, to retake control over, yeah. But um, there's something about the artistry of football that keeps attracting you. You know, and um, there's something about like, um, you know, the striving for excellence as well, you know, that's still there. And, um, and there's some, something about the kind of collective spirit that's still there, it doesn't go away, even in the, you know, the, um, the high, even within the highly paid elite footballers, you know, they still <clears throat> have some semblance of what fair play is. The, a recognition of excellence, you know, and that kind of thing, human excellence. And I think I, I like to see that at its, at its, um, at its most visible. And um, so really it shouldn't be an Everton fan, should I? <laughs> see it there, go somewhere else. But, um, you know, you look at other clubs like uh, San Paulo, you know, the German club now, it's in the second division, I think, of Bundesliga. They have a, a reputation of being kind of um, a left-leaning fan base, you know, and um, and if you're looking at kind of like socialist sentiments and community sentiments and communal sentiments in football, then um, that goes on. You know, it is a battle amongst fans, you know, to, to the um, the more ardent fans to to um, 
to push that kind of politics within their own community and San Paoli fans are part of that I suppose and uh, and other other fans like the you know there's a groups within like the Celtic um, fan fan base which um, kind of a <clears throat> send people over and you know they intermix together and share ideas that kind of thing with their San Paoli fans so there's a lot of um, and I think some of those fans actually are the, the, the ones behind some of these kind of you know, movements away towards the smaller clubs and supporting them, kind of bringing them along too. So, um, yeah, there's <clears throat> there's a good little um, there's a kind of um, the football study centre in Manchester, which um, brings together like ordinary supporters and I suppose academics who are supporters as well and write about football together in um, Manchester Metropolitan University, MMU, is it? Yeah, so it's. Um, and they have a conference every year and they, they galvanise that kind of ethic, you know, and look at the, the areas of resistance in, in football. But m mainly it's a reaction against the commercialisation of football that we've discussed tonight. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, we've got one more question, um, live question you ask. Um, apologies, I cannot pronounce your name and I don't... I'll do it. Don't worry. Let's go ahead. Sorry about uh, that. Yeah. Yes, it's uh, Vusek Lichinski. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to, uh, have a, before I ask the question, just uh, make the point that uh, football reflects society, doesn't it? So not only is it the formation of our masculinity, it's the formation of our um, way that we relate to our um, position in society. So... Um, that that's will reflect all the things that are happening there, and uh, so the uh, political economy um, uh, approach that Peter's um, been discussing um, can can be uh, complemented by the sociological study of what happens to players. You know that are on the scrap heap. You know, like my um, next door neighbour was uh, captain of Forest for a while. Um, on a scrap heap at 35. And so, you know, even though maybe in the past the, the wages were good, but they weren't as good as nowadays. So he had to get, you know, a poor uh, job in a warehouse or, 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 or um, you know, I didn't have the investment to buy pubs and things like that. So um, I think uh, so that's the role of. Um, within the football of, of forming um, the, the whole um, masculinity side and the sociological um, debris that is from capitalist um, exploitation of, of that. So I wonder if Peter will uh, have a chapter on that bit. <coughs> yeah, I don't, but I should, yeah, you're right. And um, I think in many ways, like, you know, that issue of like masculinity and um, what, what strikes me is that there's, um, in some senses, the, you know, there's, there's different masculinities, isn't it? And, and so you look at footballers and, you know, the vast amounts of money they have and the, the pruning of their personalities and public images and public image. And, and, um, and there is a kind of sense of that, you know, there's a more like sophisticated masculinity, which is different from maybe years gone by and does reflect society. You know, this more like fluid gender, if you want to take a sociological route on it. And the argument is that, you know, um, males kind of feminine side can meld quite well with the masculine side. And you see that with some football players, you know, who sport, um, you know, <clears throat> their own brands of, um, uh, you know, hairspray and um, hair products and, um, and the, you know, the kind of um, dress sense and attention to, to, you know, to dress sense and a preoccupation with, the, with how they look and how they come across. And um, so, yeah, there, there's a lot of what's going on. There's a kind of more gender fluid as well as a kind of, warrior warrior element not worry as in the worried well but 
warrior element to, to, to football players too, which is a hyper masculinity. So yeah, there's a cross reference there. And um, you know, academics have written on that as well from a sociological point of view, and, and it's and it's interesting and, and important. Yeah. Um, a lot is like based around branding, so it does come back to kind of this value asset that you're trying to, you know, you're trying to make a difference between your what you're selling, what you are as a personality becomes commodified, and what other players um, have. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think all that's important. Um, you know, in football too, there's a yeah, there's a growing, um, there's an increase in. Um, in you know, the women's game, the importance of the women's game. So we can look for really positive things in football. And that um, it's it's allowing um, increased opportunities for, for, for you know for women um, football teams, women women leads to come through and and even like the this talk of like at the moment because um, some women players are, are, are you know really um, advancing in the in the kind of skills and the and the athleticism that um, there's no reason why you shouldn't have mixed um, teams of men and women. Maybe that's going to be the thing of the future. You know, you look at some of the women's um, World Cup, most recent World Cup tournament, and uh, the greater watch. Um, yeah. So, but um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, we've got. Another question, I guess, it kind of links back to what you were saying about clubs like St. Pauli. Um, it's from Alex, um, and he asks about how are these clubs like St. Pauli, um, United, Glasgow, um, these you know these smaller clubs who are representing progressive, if you want to put it in the term, uh, politics or left wing politics. Even you know, whenever you see about clubs like the best example I can always look for is Liverpool, which is they kind of try and take the community and turn it, they also kind of turn it into the club itself and then try and sell that. So how will these clubs who are like, like we've been talking about neoliberal clubs um, tackle these smaller clubs who may try and promote um, their ideologies, you know, will these smaller clubs ever, become a big enough threat that, that, that the Premier League will want to try and take over these ideas themselves or do you think that because of the way the system is um, these smaller clubs will never be allowed to progress any further? <clears throat> yeah, um, well they could progress, yeah, and um, you know, um, FC United are progressing um, to give one example, but they, I, I would say they're becoming more commercially minded as they progress, and so um, <clears throat> uh, you know, for reasons I said before, that the to progress means to take part in the, the commercial end of the game. You know, as you move towards the top end of the game, you have to become more professional, more, and more better managed, and more efficient in the use of your resources and all those uh, kind of capitalist things. And so you have to um, take a different attitude to players. You have to look at fans as paying customers who even though they may have a part share and the ownership of the clubs, they're also, you know, taking up a dual role as, as, as owners and, and customers too. So the more that you travel down that route, the more you could get colonised by commercial, um, the commercial ethic. You know. um, <clears throat> I think in the case of like left-wing fans, then to take your, your point there, then um, it's, it's been, you know, a, a case has been made that, um, the owners of like the clubs like you know, San Pauli in, in, in Germany um, are quite happy with the kind of like you know the the kind of radical left standpoint of the um, of the fans because it gives them a difference it gives that club like a difference you know you're always looking to sell your club and brand your club and on the basis of like something that is different from another club to attract maybe more fans or to give you that sense of identity with against other clubs you know that you can market. And so there's a kind of marketing going on because when the San Paoli fans display all their, you know, very colourful flags and, and wave, wave the, the banners and so forth, that's a spectacle that is, is good for advertisers too. And um, so that's the irony of that. It can be colonised that way. 
because you're dealing with a capitalist entity and you're on their grounds. The left-wing politics are something separate that really happens outside the ground and um, is taken into the ground, but very rarely converts a club into anything else except a commercial entity that it is. <clears throat> and that's always been the way. Um, I've got another question here in regards to what's happening right now. Um, you know, with COVID, the, the stadiums are empty. And as a fan, this is from Mike, sorry, but the stadiums are empty because of COVID. And as a fan, it, it is kind of strange to see. Um, you know, I live in Ireland, so it, I can't attend Liverpool matches as much as I want. But even then, like a stadium empty, it almost feels like it's not worth watching because it doesn't feel like it's football anymore. It almost feels like a video game or a movie. It's It doesn't feel like it's... um a real game and it does kind of lay bare this whole thing where you know is the game being played out for the fans or is it being played out to finish contracts to abide by rules for um you know for, for advertising purposes you know for liverpool we had to finish our season to move on from our current uh kit sponsor or past kit sponsors new balance and get our nike sponsorship so in terms of what mike's asking is you know what impact does the disappearance of fans have from the stadium? You know, is it going to change the game going forwards? You know, once the fans are allowed back in, you know, how, how do you see that developing? <clears throat> I think it's only probably short term anyway, relatively with the COVID situation. But what it does is expose um, the fact that the, the spectacle, the game, the, you know, the commodity that's produced is nothing without the fans in the, um, in, in the stadium. And so what you have is a kind of despoiled commodity there. And so um, while clubs gain most of their revenues outside of season tickets and fan, you know, fans going through the turnstiles, um, <clears throat> nevertheless, if, if it's an inferior commodity, then you're in danger of maybe losing the advertisement streams in the future if it went on. In the, in the short term, for elite clubs, it's fine. But lower down the scale, that's where the problem lies because... Um, most football clubs um, can't rely on the vast amounts of uh, media rights and the um, advertisements from big corporations. Any advertisements they, that come their way are from probably second grade, you know, lower down the scale um, businesses, local local businesses, and that, and they rely he um, heavily on them um, ticket sales and, and match attendance, and so the, for them it's a kind of survival. Right now, and, and there could be a lot going to the wall. Wigan, as you mentioned right at the start, have been, you know, COVID brought together quite a lot of different things with Wigan, but it is kind of like the um, the melting point, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. And <clears throat> um, lower down the scale, then clubs are going to find it difficult to, as we as we read to um, survive, and we'll need um, some sort of funds coming in from somewhere to. And whether the EPL will allow funds to trickle down enough to keep those football clubs alive is a, is a, is a matter for debate. Certainly not doing that right now. Um, but um, but for, the, for the big guns, the elite football clubs, then um, they, they've got more than enough money and resources to, to ride this out. And, um, but it does, what it, what's more interesting is what it exposes and it exposes that um, the football fans that populate the stadium and produce that atmosphere are part of um, the product, you know, and unpaid wages. In fact, they have to pay for the privilege. So they have a funny position of being <clears throat> exploited um, while paying for the privilege of being exploited because, you know, you got a stadium, as we've seen the stadiums and matches that have been covered over the past month or so before the end of the season. There are a, you know, there's a shadow of the games that were played with the full, full stadium, and um, and that's because the, the the fans play their role. They use their labour power, even though they don't sell it, to create that product. So it exposes that from, a, you know, from a, from one point of view. Um, but there's enough revenue coming in, but that that would be in danger over a long period, but not not. Not in the short period. And depends how long COVID lasts. How long do you think it's going to last? 
It's a good question. I, I've I've seen a few clubs in Europe bring in people in the matches, um, even during the worst parts of COVID. I think in Denmark they had play um, fans socially distancing inside um, the stadiums. Like so, I'm I'm wondering, you know, which club's going to take the first step. To be honest, yeah, Tottenham thought um, it was and now it's not. Pardon? Tottenham thought it was on Sunday, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's been a reversal, hasn't he, in this idea? Because it was talented, you know. But there's a there's a grievance. I, I was talking to a Celtic fan and season ticket holder, and they they were kind of disappointed in many ways that some fans are going to be selected for going in. They have a mm. season ticket, they can't get into the game. They haven't been selected, so it causes controversy amongst fans themselves. But... <laughs> Um, I've actually got a question here, um, and it's actually something I was going to talk about, which is the relationship of uh, and, uh, Liverpool and Everton. Um, Jed asks about kind of, I think he's alluding to how we were once one club and now maybe in the future we'll be one again. And uh, I guess I didn't even know you were Liverpool, uh, an Everton fan when I was about to host this, so I think it's just a happy coincidence, really. But, you know, before it's it's I guess this is not so much about you know Marxism itself, but I think it's a good way to kind of wrap this up too, which is you know Liverpool and Everton used to be, uh, you know, they they obviously were one club, and even going forwards into you know um, the eighties and in even up to the nineties, you know, you had a a derby day like you know you wouldn't have a problem of fans mixing in the stadium, and you don't really see that now, and you know that is something that I've I've talked to older you know older Liverpool fans about about how that's missing from the you know Liverpool as a city you know the two clubs have and I think it is a part of commercialization as well I, I'm not an expert on that but I do feel like they've grown apart so much that it doesn't feel the rivalry doesn't feel as fierce anymore and yet you also have things like the fans supporting food banks in the city you know both clubs coming together to kind of support food banks. So I just I think it'd be a good way to wrap it up a bit, but to say, you know, how do you see Liverpool and Everton going into the future as two different clubs? You know, Liverpool's success has helped us get some great players and uh, develop our stand, but Everton has also got a bit of investment, and they're actually you are going to build that new stadium, hopefully down by the Merseyside. So you know, I'm I'm very curious about how you feel about the city as a whole going forwards and the two two teams. Yeah. I don't know. It it depends on the success of Everton. If, if Everton can compete with Liverpool in, on the, on the pitch and in terms of trophies, then you're going to get that rivalry back the way it was, say, in the 60s and 70s. But it was more evenly balanced, and it was more important to Derby Day than, say, a Liverpool Man United or Man City game. It all depends on the competition, really, doesn't it? You know, and what's what's tended to happen is the rivalry takes new forms. So at the moment, as you say, there's a kind of separation, a polarisation, and um, you know, and, and that reflects itself in, in terms of like Liverpool fans having great success relative to, to Everton fans. And so there's a kind of, um, you know, there's a different kind of rivalry there, not on the pitch, but in terms of like um, just, a, you know, a kind of that between a successful club and the fans of a successful club relatively to fans of a club that hasn't has been less successful and um, so it's just changed in that regard the, the kind of um, but the allegiance as I see it hasn't changed much it's just the way it's expressed and um, there's a myth going around that Everton and Liverpool fans can sort of get together and shake hands and kind of arm and arm going into the derby match and it's never ever been that way there's been a big rivalry and um, you know, we don't. We, it's not located in particular spheres of any city, any part of the city, and it's not expressed in terms of the the old firm kind of rivalry. But nevertheless, it's, it's there, and um, whole families are either Evertonians or Liverpoolians, and there's very few um, that are mixed. You know, um, so um, you know, my uh, my my partner's from Liverpool, like me. She's come from a Liverpool family. And she hasn't changed, and I, 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 I've got no hope of changing it. And she hasn't changed <laughs> me, and that would like express itself across the pool. I think. I think one thing is that the fan base has changed too. That you know, um, 
Liverpool fan base is probably extends beyond Merseyside more and the city of Liverpool more than Evans does. So that rivalry is expressed in different ways than through the global fan base, you know, gets dispersed. And um, and also the, the fact that, you know, there's a greater um, diaspora of Everton and Liverpool fans with globalisation, you know, with um, yeah, expat communities in the USA and God knows elsewhere. So and they believe they're part of the community. So the community has, has been displaced from the sense of like, you know, one space, one locality. So it's, it's different. And I suppose that's where sociology comes in a little bit, mm. doing all that those stupid concepts it brings up about space and place and <laughs> stuff like that, you know. Yeah. How do you feel about the new stadium then? Are you gonna are you happy about it or um I'm I'm still skeptical about it actually coming to be. So, you know I think when uh, anyone like Ken Rice is in still got his grip on power there, even though uh Mashiri is the the um the main money bags there, you know. Um then um, you got to be sceptical, you know, he's failed a number of times and um, so we'll wait and see. It's, um, the plans are being called in anyway now by um, uh, the Heritage um, uh, Society and <clears throat> probably quite rightly, you know, the kind of um, tin pots that Everton wanted to put up in different areas of Liverpool deserves to be knocked down by the plan authorities. <laughs> so we'll wait and see over that one. But um, should just do good to sum up and then um, or take over Stanley Park and um, get a bit closer to Liverpool and knock down one of their stands as we're doing it. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. I'm a close. <laughs> I always say, though, um, I love that whenever we built up the main stand, I noticed you just put up a wee bit of coverage to stop, you know, the Anfield from peeking over, like, you know, so. Well, that's it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> the posh, posh part looking over at the <laughs> well Peter thank you very much it's, it's been a pleasure you know um, as a big football fan and a you know socialist and obviously great to have a, a scouser talking about football you know uh, Liverpool's a great city for you know both regards of football and socialism so it's been a pleasure and, and been able to, a proper education for myself and uh, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us all right, Lewis, thanks for that. Thanks, mate. Uh, just so you couldn't have organised a bit better and I would have done that if um, I'd have had more time and, um, you know, to get it together. So, good. Yeah, great. Thanks, thanks for that. Worries. I think there was some wires crossed with the education uh, team here, but who knows, maybe we'll have you on again soon uh, at, you know, Christmas time whenever Everton are top of the league or something like that there. Yeah, you can have us definitely back on then. <laughs> Well, anyway, thanks very much and good luck for the rest of the season. Yeah, uh, on you too. Thanks very much, no worries. Yeah, we'll put reserves, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost 20 degrees of that now, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Lewis, thanks. Cheers, have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.